Good morning and welcome. Uh, what a privilege is ours as we meet on this Lord's Day and our annual harvest service. We give thanks for Almighty God's provision for every aspect of our lives and offer him this morning our worship and our praise. Thanks to the ladies who have decorated our church so beautifully and thanks in advance to all who participate in our service today. If you're a visit this morning, you're especially welcome. Uh, thank you for joining with us and we trust you will experience joy as you worship with us today. And as we do each Sunday, remember those in our fellowship who cannot be here for whatever reason. On this special day in our church calendar, and as you view your or listen later, we trust this act of worship will be a blessing to you and your families. And I apologize in advance for a number of announcements this morning. The first one uh, is Bible study on Wednesday evening here in the church building, DV at 7.30. As we focus on the next installment on the study, Publication Proximity, please plan to attend. And if you haven't been present at the earlier meetings, please don't worry, as each of the sections are standalone. And then the first announcement, uh, other announcement is from uh, Sam McGregor in uh, target session Drummer Coles in relation to the Boys Brigade. Uh, first, Drummer Coles Boys Brigade Company hope to restart again on the 5th of November, but we can only do this if we recruit new officers and helpers to work in the company on a regular basis. We currently need two more adults in the junior section just to meet the very minimum requirements. But ideally, we require more in all three sections so that the existing officers and helpers can work comfortably to deliver a successful program for the boys. If you are unable to, sorry, if we are unable to get suitable members or officers and leaders in the next three weeks, then the company cannot restart in full and we look forward to restart in a much reduced capacity. If you're interested or willing to take part uh, in this valuable and rewarding service within the church, then please contact Mr. Sam McGregor. And if someone needs his contact details, I can, I can pass those on to you. And then one in relation then to Drummer Coos and Dermore Youth Fellowship uh, from Joanne Garrick. We're delighted to be starting back on Sunday the 10th, which is tonight, from 7 to 8 in Drummer Coos Church Hall. Uh, the Drummer Coos and Dermore Youth, Youth Fellowship is open to everyone in secondary school, and you'd be most welcome. If you haven't received a consent form, please contact Alex, Jenny, or Chris. And cons consent forms may be, must be handed in on the person's first night. We will continue to meet on the second and first Sunday of the month. Looking forward to seeing you all. And P.S. Face masks to be worn and other COVID protocols to apply. And then uh, you will recall that prior to the COVID restrictions, we had provided opportunity in church for donations to the local food bank. We have been asked if we could resume this practice within, with the emphasis on small food, food items for Christmas meals, etc. A box will be located in the vestibule for those wishing to donate in the weeks leading up to Christmas. And then uh, advance notice that we will be holding a short congregational meeting after worship on Sunday, the 24th of October, to discuss and adopt the annual accounts for 2020. That's all the announcements. And finally this morning, extend a warm welcome to Carla Wilson. Carl, thank you for coming back to Leader of Worship. Delighted to have you with us again. Looking forward to your message to you this morning. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's, it is lovely to be back with you, especially on such a beautiful morning. And we're here to worship God, and we're here to give thanks for the harvest. Before we begin, can I remind you that when we stand to sing, you must put on your face mask. Thank you. So our call to worship this morning comes from the book of Psalms, Psalm 100. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Praise the Lord. So we begin our service this morning with um, our first praise, and we will stand to sing, and it comes from Psalm 65, verses 9 to 13, Earth thou dost visit.
And now as we continue our worship this morning, we're going to take some time to bring our praise and adoration and confession to our Lord. So let us pray together. O Lord, you are the King of Kings, and we worship and adore you. Jesus, Lord of heaven and earth, we bow down at your feet. Jesus, sovereign Lord, we worship and adore you. Jesus, you are the name above all names, and we bow down at your feet. Jesus, you are the light of the world, and we worship and adore you. O oh Lord, as we bring our worship to you this morning, we know that we fall so far short of your holiness, your glory, and your beauty. We know that we have sinned against you and against our fellow man. We know that we are not worthy to be called your children. Yet we believe that you love us still and that your love for us is unchanging. Have mercy upon us, O Lord. Grant us true repentance. Forgive us all that is past. Cleanse and renew us and help us to rise victorious over every weakness in the strength of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now we have um, a treat coming now. Uh, Chris and Claire are coming to sing Rock of Ages. We'll remain seated and listen. Let me hide myself. 
myself in thee. Thank you very much, Chris and Claire. Uh, that's wonderful to be reminded of the Rock of Ages, especially on this harvest day, when we think about God's faithfulness to us and to the generations that have gone before. Our Bible reading this morning comes from the Old Testament, uh, the book of Genesis, chapter 17. And we're going to read uh, from verse 1 to verse 22. It's quite a long reading, but it's important that we get a picture of the whole situation here so that we understand what's going on before we come to the sermon. Genesis chapter 17, beginning at verse 1. Excuse me. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan where you are now an alien I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. Then God said to Abraham, As for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant that you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born in your household or bought with money from a foreigner, those who are not your offspring. Whether born in your household or bought with your money, they must be circumcised. 
My covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. God also said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations and kings of people will come from her. Abraham fell face down. He laughed and he said to himself, will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael might live under your blessing. Then God said, yes, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of 12 rulers and I will make him into a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. When he had finished speaking with Abraham, God went up from him. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Now, do we have any boys and girls this morning? Can you pop up your hand just so that I can see where you are? There's lovely two here and one at the back. Oh, yes, lovely. Oh, great, great. I think the last time I was here, only two or three boys and girls. So, boys and girls, who can tell me what special Sunday this is? Can I hear you? Yes? Good for you. This is Harvest Sunday, and this is when we come to give thanks to God for his faithfulness to us and to the land and all the crops and everything that are, have faithfully grown and been harvested and brought in, and we know that we have provision and food for another year. This morning, we're going to talk about God's promises with the big people. And who can tell me what is a promise? Hmm? Anybody tell me what is a promise? Okay. Um, well, a promise is very simple, isn't it? It's, it's an assurance that you will or won't do a certain thing. And you might make a promise to someone else. And I'm making a promise to you boys and girls that I'm going to do something for you at the end of this talk. Do you think I will keep my promise? Hmm? Does anybody think I won't keep my promise? No, no, no comments, okay. Well, who do you make promises to, boys and girls? Who can tell me who them, you might make a promise to? Yes? Your friends, very good. Would anybody make a promise to their mum? And they might say, I promise I'll be very good, mummy, and I won't argue with my sister. Does that sound familiar? Mm-hmm. Or I promise, Mum, I will keep my bedroom tidy. Anybody heard that before? Or I promise, Dad, I will empty the dishwasher for you. No, 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 you must all have great lives if you don't have to do anything, isn't that? That's great. Well, if you make a promise to your friend or to your brother or sister or to anyone, do you keep your promises? Mm-hmm. Who has promised to be good and not argue with their sister and kept that for about five minutes and then started arguing again? Hmm? Well, why do you not keep your promise? Hmm? Well, maybe it's just that it's too hard and sometimes you just can't be bothered and everybody's the same. But thankfully, God is not like that. And when God makes a promise... He never decides he can't be bothered, he's too tired, or whatever. 
And in our reading this morning that we've just read, we see God making a special promise to a very old man called Abraham. He promised that Abraham and his wife would have a baby boy, even though Abraham and Sarah were very, very, very old people. And God took Abraham outside and pointed up to the stars in the heavens and told Abraham that his family would be so numerous that they would be far more in number than the skies, or sorry, than the stars up in the heavens. Now, do you think that God kept that promise? What do you think? Do you think he did? Yes. Yes, of course he did. God always keeps his promise. And God was faithful, and over hundreds of years, God gave Abraham lots of descendants to his own, to God's family and to Abraham's family. And long after Abraham was dead, years and years and years later, there was a very special baby born into Abraham's family. Who knows who that very special baby was? Yes? Sorry? Jesus, that's right. Jesus was a direct descendant of Abraham. And he grew up into a very special man and he called people to follow him. And Jesus promised that when you, you or I or anybody follows him, that he will look after us and keep us safe forevermore. And do you think that Jesus would keep that promise? Yes, I think he would because Jesus is God and Jesus never ever breaks his promise. And I made a promise at the beginning of this little talk, boys and girls, that I had, would do something for you at the end of this talk. So I'm gonna keep my promise and I'm gonna ask everybody to close their eyes and I'm going to pray especially for you boys and girls this morning. So let's close our eyes and pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you are faithful and that when you make a promise, you never break your word. And we thank you that Jesus, when he makes a promise, he never breaks his word either. And I pray for these children, these boys and girls, Father, that you will bless them and that you will bless them the way you blessed Abraham and you kept faith and were faithful to Abraham. And I pray that you will watch over these boys and girls and keep them safe and in the palm of your hand forevermore. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, boys and girls, for listening so well. Now we come to our next uh, item of praise. And it's a lovely, lovely harvest hymn. You're going to know this one. And uh, hymn 51, Come, you thankful people, come.
And now we're going to take some time and step aside into God's nearer presence and still our hearts and minds and bring our, uh, our prayers of intercession to him. So let's pray together. O oh Lord, our God, we praise you, we bless you, and we give you thanks for your immeasurable goodness to those who trust in you. We thank you for having loved us to the point of sending your son to redeem us. In him we have seen your face. In him we have heard your word. Through him we have received your spirit and become your children. And from him we have known your plan and have learned to call you Father. For your immeasurable goodness to us and for the love that draws us together, we praise you, we bless you, and we give you thanks. Lord Jesus, as we celebrate harvest, we know that many people have full larders with bread enough to spare. Yet inwardly they are hungry for the things of the Spirit. Lord, you are the bread of life, and without you our hearts go hungry and our lives are empty. Help us to feed forever on you by faith, that we may know the abundant life that you came to bring to us all for the glory of your name. Most merciful God, this morning at harvest we commend to your care the men, women and children of our world who are suffering distress and anxiety through lack of food. Strengthen and support them in their need and grant that all nations may grow in concern for one another and in their readiness to share all of your provision for mankind and may your kingdom come through Jesus our Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the friend of the friendless. You are the hope of the hopeless and the joy of the joyless. Will you reach out into the hurt and pain of our world? The injustice, the hunger and the hatred. And may the seeds of your kingdom take root and grow. That in all this world's suffering and sorrow, you may bring a harvest of justice and peace, of love and celebration. And now we're going to take a few moments in silent prayer when we will bring the prayers of our hearts to the Lord. Our loving Father, as we pray for all those who are troubled at this time and for those who suffer in body or mind or spirit, we ask that in your goodness and mercy, you may grant them health of body, soundness of mind, peace of heart, and the balm of your comfort, that in wholeness of being, they may glorify your name. And we bring all of our prayers to you through the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to have another treat now. Uh, Jane and the Durhamore Quartet are coming to sing to us. So um, sit quietly and listen and appreciate
and the crops have failed and the fields are bare, my soul will cry to the Lord. When the hungry poor know of death's despair, my heart gives the Thank you, ladies. That was really beautiful. Now, as we come to our sermon, uh, let us just uh, close our eyes and ask for God's help. Let's pray. O oh God, our Father, grant that in the written word and through my spoken word, we may behold the living word, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you have a Bible, you may like to keep it open at Genesis chapter 17, uh, the portion that we've just read, because I'll be referring to it on and off as we go through. Now, have you ever watched the television program, Who Do You Think You Are? Who ever watches that? Me? Am I the only one? <laughs> Isn't there something fascinating uh, in knowing more about the people that you're descended from? Am I alone in that? Maybe. <laughs> There's the hope that maybe someone in your past family has done something good or noble, like Nigella Lawson's grandfather. Nigella discovered that her grandfather had been attached to one of the regiments who liberated Belson concentration camp during the Second World War. Naturally, you might worry that there's a dreadful secret somewhere in the family. I'm sure we all have them in the background. A secret like the one that Esther Ranson found. When she went on the program, she learned that her great-grandfather accidentally shot and killed the family's parlor maid. So hopefully any secrets are not as dramatic as that. Or perhaps you're apprehensive about uncovering a long-forgotten family tragedy. A tragedy like the one that Bill Oddy discovered when he was on the program and he was told that his great-grandfather, who was a night watchman, met a nasty end when the poor man tripped into a vat of boiling brine. Not the sort of thing you want to happen. Well, I've always been fascinated about my own family's history. And, you know, we have mystery on both sides of the family and I would love to delve into it. If only I had access to all the resources that who do you think you are um, had access to. The researchers there always seem to find the records or the newspaper clippings that provide the answers. And then they bring these deceased relatives back to life, if you like. In the television program, of course, all the focus is on the past and on the ancestors who came before. But in Genesis 17, the passage that we read earlier, God's focus is on the future, and it's on the future of Abraham and his descendants, and it's on the future harvest of God's people, the harvest that God will reap throughout time. But before we go on to look in more detail at Genesis 17, let's recap on what's been happening in Abram's life so far. Well, in Genesis 12, we discover that Abram is 75 years old when God calls him. Uh, he and Sarah, his wife, are childless, and yet God promises to make Abraham into a great nation. Genesis 16 tells us the story of Abraham when he's 86 years old, 
when his son Ishmael is born after a liaison with Sarah's servant called Hagar, Abraham and Sarah remain childless. And in our reading in Genesis 17, Abraham is 99 years old when God makes the covenant of circumcision with him and reaffirms that Abraham will be the father of many nations. And Abraham and Sarah are still childless. At the point that we met him this morning in chapter 17, Abraham has been following and trusting God and trusting God's promise for almost 25 years, even though there's no outward sign of God fulfilling this covenant. There's no outward sign of God sowing any seed in preparation for God's harvest. Earlier in Genesis in chapter 15, you can read the, the account of the, of the covenant that God makes with Abraham. And in our passage in Genesis 17, we read about God confirming that covenant and giving many more details about it. So what is a covenant? Well, in its simplest form, a covenant is an agreement that formally binds together two parties into a relationship. Firstly, it's on the basis of mutual personal commitment. Each party must make a personal commitment to be bound by the agreement. And secondly, there are consequences for keeping and consequences for breaking the covenant. In Abraham's case, there will be blessing for keeping the agreement and punishment for breaking it. And in, this, in our text this morning, we read about God making this type of covenant with Abraham and his descendants who will come after him. Now, although the covenant is made directly with Abraham, who is the seed, if you like, God emphasizes that Abraham's descendants are also included in the harvest, or sorry, in the agreement. And his descendants will be the harvest, if you like. So isn't this amazing that God is making a covenant with people who are not even yet born? In the first eight verses of chapter 17, we see God confirming the details of his covenant with Abraham. God introduces himself to Abraham and to us as El Shaddai. God Almighty, I think, is the translation in our Bible. But that means God Almighty, the powerful one. And God's power is going to be needed if Sarai's childlessness is ever going to be reversed. But before he confirms his covenant, God says to Abraham, walk before me and be blameless. And this is the, per the personal commitment that's required from Abraham in order to keep his part of the covenant. And God then goes on to confirm his covenant with Abraham by giving the exact details of what he, that is God, will do to keep God's side of the agreement. God says, you will be the father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will establish an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants. These are all promises for the future. And there's no evidence yet of any of these being fulfilled. And they fly in the face of the reality of Abraham's situation at this time. He is 99 years old. His wife, Sarah, is 90 years old. And they're still childless. So how on earth is this covenant ever going to be fulfilled? Well, in verse 7, God promises that the covenant will be ongoing. It will extend from one generation to another. It will be rolled out into the future. It will be an everlasting covenant. It will never end, and it will continue into eternity. So here we find in this uh, chapter 17, Abraham is starring in his own episode of Who Do You Think You Are? Except in Abraham's case, he's not looking back at his ancestors. He's looking forward 
to his descendants. There's no genealogist here researching old records to discover who Abraham came from or unearthing old skeletons in cupboards. God's focus is on the future. His promise to make Abraham a father of many nations and to give Abraham and his descendants a new land and a new identity. In verses 9 to 14, the text gives details of the part that Abraham and his descendants must play to remain faithful to God's promises and to receive God's blessing. The obedience of Abraham and his descendants is essential if they are to receive the benefits of the covenant. God decrees that the mark or the sign of the covenant will be the circumcision of every male who is eight days old and over. Now, circumcision is not a Hebrew invention. It was practiced in Egypt since ancient times as a mark of ritual purity, and also in the nations around where Abraham was living. It marked the transition to adult status within the tribe. But for Abraham and his descendants, circumcision was an outward sign of a relationship, the most important relationship that they would ever have. God is to be their God, and they are to be his people. Isn't that wonderful? Circumcision was a mark of God's ownership and a constant reminder to his people of the covenant between God and Abraham and Abraham's descendants. And so Abraham's who do you think you are experience is continuing as he hears what God is telling him about his future. And this is God himself who is telling Abraham who God is and how Abraham's future will unfold. And even though all the circumstances say differently, God stresses that Abraham and Sarah will become parents. Abraham's family tree is being written by God himself. However, El Shaddai's mighty power will be needed to make these geriatric couple into new parents. In verse 15 to 22, God tells Abraham that the covenant will be inherited by the son that Abraham and Sarah will have. The son not yet born and probably not even conceived at this point. This son will be born within the following year and he is to be named Isaac. This child will be the long-awaited offspring of Abraham and Sarah. And Isaac's birth will be the next stage in the unfolding of God's plan. Now we know, of course, that this actually happened and that God kept his promise to Abraham because we can find the account in the Old Testament. So just as in who, the program, Who Do You Think You Are?, the history is recorded. And if we know where to look for it and do a little research, we are able to look back. But Abraham had to look forward and trust that God would fulfill his promise. You might be asking yourself, well, that's very interesting, Carol, but what has this ancient covenant got to do with me this morning in Durhamore on Harvest Sunday? Why is any of this important to me today? Well, we already know that this unique line of Abraham's descendants begins with his son Isaac. But did you hear in the children's talk that it eventually leads to Jesus? Did you pick that up? Yes, Jesus is a direct descendant of Abraham. Jesus is the one through whom God's blessing is now mediated in a redeeming way to mankind. God's blessing now comes through Christ Jesus and it's open to all mankind, including you and me. In Genesis uh, 17 that we just read, verse 7, let's, let's look at that again. It says, God says to Abraham, 
I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. And that promise that was made to Abraham all those generations ago is still being fulfilled today. Isn't that amazing? But you might ask, how is that being fulfilled today? Well, Matthew's Gospel records at the Last Supper that Jesus offers the cup of wine to his disciples and he says, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And here Jesus is proclaiming that the imminent shedding of his blood will absorb completely God's wrath over the sin of mankind once and forever. Jesus' sacrificial death will freely offer God's redemption to anyone who puts their trust in Christ and who follows him. And this is the new covenant. Not that it cancels the original covenant, but rather this is a better, a more complete covenant. And the mark or the sign of this new covenant is also circumcision. However, now it's a circumcision of the heart, a circumcision in our core being, a sign that we belong to God that is in our very core being. For each believer, this is the sign of our relationship, the most important relationship that we are, will ever have. God is to be our God and we are to be his people. And we are to be the harvest that God continues to gather in. And this is the continuing fulfillment of God's promise that he made to Abraham many, many generations ago. And just as in the original covenant between God and Abraham, there are consequences for keeping or breaking this new covenant as well. For anyone who puts their trust in Jesus and follows him, they will find God's blessing. However, for anyone who rejects Jesus and turns their back on him, there will be eternal separation from God. In the New Testament in Galatians, the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Galatia saying, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So anyone who belongs to Christ, who puts their trust in him and follows him, is part of Abraham's family. So if you belong to Jesus this morning, then Abraham is the forefather of your faith and mine. And we can trace our spiritual heritage back to him. Imagine, if you and I belong to Christ, then we are part of the continuing fulfillment of God's ancient covenant with Abraham. Isn't that wonderful? So this morning, if you were to take part in a faith edition of Who Do You Think You Are? What would your faith family tree look like? Would it show Christ at the head leading back to Abraham? Or would it be a blank page leading nowhere because you have opted out of the spiritual heritage that God offers to you? Do you belong to Christ? Are you an heir of God's promise? Are you a descendant of Abraham? Are you a part of God's harvest this morning? So this morning in Durhamore, who do you think you are? Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness and we thank you for your goodness and your mercy to mankind. And we thank you that you made that covenant with Abraham and even today, so many thousands of years later, you are continuing to fulfill that. Father, draw us near 
open our hearts and our minds to understand the heritage that we have in you and the richness of the faith that we have in you, but above all, that you are faithful and that you are merciful and that you are good. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, as we bring the, the service to a close this morning, and we have another praise item, hymn 59, we ply the fields and scatter. And we have another uh, piece of praise to sing just as we're finishing the doxology. Let us pray together. O oh Lord, our God, we thank you for all your goodness to us. We receive from you so much more than we will ever need. 
May we always remember that every good gift that we have comes directly from your hand. And Father, will you accept these tokens, tithes and offerings of our love and thankfulness, which we offer back to you with grateful hearts. Please use them in the building of your kingdom and for your glory. Amen. May the love of God enfold us. May the mercy of God absolve us. May the strength of God support us. And may the peace of God console us. And may the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen.